So today we're going to be talking about diabetes and the gut. I'm Dr. Martin Rutherford, certified functional medicine practitioner and chiropractor. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractor. And so um, the gut is something we've been highly criticized for talking about a lot when we first started doing all of this. Uh, and and uh, it, was, it was the first year, year and a half, that was like, are you ever gonna talk about anything else but the intestines and the gut and the stomach and the intestines and the bacteria? And, and the answer was no. <laughs> no, that's right. Now what's kind of cool is um, now we're kind of has-beens. <laughs> now it's like now everybody in planet Earth is doing research on the gut, which is good. Saw an article yesterday. I always read the Wall Street Journal because those things come out first because those were the research. When research comes out on the gut or research comes out on anything like that that's going to result in a drug, <laughs> it comes out in the Wall Street Journal because they're you know, the companies want you to know that they're on top of it now. But so I've been seeing a lot of that and a lot of um, that, uh, another uh, uh, article from England on bacteria in the gut. So, so diabetes in the gut. And I was going to ask Dr. Gates a few questions before he got here, but we just kind of throwing this together. So I might throw a question or two at you relative to some things I've been wondering about mm -hmm. relative to diabetes in the gut and and, and who gets it, uh, and, and how much of it, the, the thing I'll throw out there is, a lot of people really eat terribly in this country and don't get diabetes. And then there's a lot of people who eat terribly in this country and get diabetes. Mm -hmm. How much of a factor is what you're gonna talk about when you get to that point in there? Uh -huh. That was kind uh -huh. of my curiosity, like my thought process of, doing the interviews and of course we have people that come in here who are thin and eat properly and run 20 miles a day and develop diabetes type 2. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I assume some of that is going to be relevant to what, what we're going to discuss today. Yeah, the basic answer is that there are genetic predispositions for being susceptible for inflammatory bacteria or referred to as obesogenic bacteria to live in the intestines and the colon. Okay. <clears throat> and so he's on. <laughs> that's that's the answer to that. And but the other side of it is that we have this growing proportion of diabetes. One out of three individuals are overweight, one out of three individuals are obese. About it's more than ten percent of the population <laughs> is diabetic. One third of the population is pre diabetic. It's estimated, I think, by twenty fifty that uh, one third of the population will be diabetic and two thirds of the population will be obese. So that's the rate that we're going at. It's extremely alarming. I mean, when you were a kid, diabetes I'm sure existed, but type two was not nearly as common, especially when your parents. Oh were, no, when somebody got diabetes know. then, it was like right. the end of the world. It was yeah. like, they have diabetes. So it was very unusual. And now it's like everybody has pre-diabetes. <sighs> or diabetes, you're looking at 40% of the population just right now. Which you might also know is like metabolic syndrome. Metabolic just, syndrome. Just saying the way your doctors might into that. say, well, you don't really have to worry about it too much yet because you really just have metabolic syndrome or mm -hmm. syndrome X or right. something like that. But, but you do have to worry about it. And as Dr. Rutherford said, we were criticized early on because we were talking about the gut at nauseum and at length. And now it's like common knowledge but back then we were putting out all these relationships between the gastrointestinal tract and systemic disease, including diabetes. And we were talking about a lot of the literature, how pieces of bacteria break off from the intestines, go into the bloodstream, how that interferes with insulin signaling. It's called subclinical endotoxemia. And it's throughout the literature now in the diabetes realm and the obesity realm. So a uh, current article came out of the journal Diabetologia and they basically came out and said, this is a well-accepted fact in type two diabetes, but let's look at pre-diabetes. And they basically found this bacterial landscape is skewed in pre-diabetes as well. More and more evidence that the gut is the genesis of this issue. So from that perspective, and when we say the gut's the genesis of the issue, it's the, the issue genesis. being developing diabetes. Or pre-diabetes, the issue is pre that how does the American diet and the American lifestyle play into that as well? Because, you know, we're eating a lot of saturated fats. We're eating a lot of processed carbohydrates. We eat a lot of high fructose corn syrup. <clears throat> so all those things are playing into this microbial 
transition going on in the guts of Americans. You know, was, uh, we had a friend here from India this week, and mo uh, I, uh, I mentioned that because I'm not even sure if you're aware that he's an Ayurvedic practitioner. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, I, I took this particular week to drill him <laughs> mm -hmm. extensively because he's been a vegetarian his entire life, mm -hmm. has never eaten meat, doesn't take B12 vitamins, uh, and, and, uh, and never gets sick. <laughs> he's certainly not. He's not overweight, but he's not thin. I mean, a lot of people will say, oh, the vegetarians are gone. And we had, a, a, an, we had an extensive discussion about the bacteria in the gut and mm -hmm. some of his feelings about the foods that we eat and how here we could never change our diet. He had a, he had a lot of attention on the mouth. He said, we brush our teeth too much and we do too many, uh, too many, uh, um, what, what is it? Washing. Yeah, like Listerine, killing all. Yeah. He says, yes, you kill the good bacteria too. And he <laughs> says, these are very important. So, uh, so his point was, and you've mentioned it a couple of times relative to us living maybe too pristine of a, of, of a lifestyle where we kill off all of the, all the good bacteria with the bad bacteria and then we get these, and then we get these abnormal issues, but we're in our gut, you know, from the bacteria. But I mean, it's, there's a, they're now saying you know, autoimmunity comes from the gut. Most of it comes from the gut. But, but the, thing that I, <clears throat> the thing that I was interested in was we do see a lot of people come in who have prediabetes and are headed to diabetes, and a lot of them are talk, taught that it's not a big deal. And uh, uh, not until you get to diabetes, and it, it is a big deal because I think it could take right. 10 years for you to go to prediabetes 10, 20, and yeah. diabetes. One of the things that we treat a lot of is small fiber neuropathy. And a lot of that is caused by pre-diabetes that people have been told <laughs> uh, not to worry about. And, mm -hmm. it, and it happens to be their big problem. But, but, it, but it was my interest. I, I was wondering if you had an opinion on, are, is this the key to people developing the diabetes? Is the bad bacteria the key? Well, in other words, how many, how many if, of all the people who eat poorly, Okay, and it's a lot. All right, w would you render a guess clinically in your observation of how many of them would not get diabetes even if they were eating poorly? If they, in other words, if they didn't have the, the bad bacteria, would they get diabetes as much? Probably not, but the bad bacteria are a manifestation of the transition in the American lifestyle okay. and the industrialized okay. world lifestyle. And so that's what everybody's talking about. Nobody really knows why. Our, the microbiome has gone rogue in contemporary society. As Dr. Rutherford says, it's just because we're too clean. Is it because we take too many antibiotics? Is it immunizations? Is it the American food supply, which expands to many different countries? We don't know. We just don't know. I mean, we can't say definitively it's one thing or another, but we can say that there is this effect and the researchers have found that high processed diets, processed carbohydrates, saturated fats, seem to be the factors that grow these bad gut bacteria. Okay. And that's what a lot of people eat. Even if you think you're eating healthy, frequently you're not eating healthy. So the practical aspect of this is, if you are overweight, for this issue, for this issue if you're overweight and, you, uh, and, and you're having and you're changing your diets and you're eating well uh, and you're not losing weight or if you're pre-diabetic and your numbers are staying up no matter what you do um, to probably start thinking about the fact that there's probably a factor in your intestines bacteria that is creating this effect mm -hmm. that you need to look into in order to change that mm -hmm. and, and that that would be a uh, this would be the patient, a lot of, it, most of the times the patient comes in here and they're not even in here for weight loss. They're usually in here for fibromyalgia or peripheral neuropathy or something, else, or yeah. something else. And then eventually they'll come out, I've tried to lose weight, I can't lose weight and I've gone on diets. And you know, then you find out they have a lot of symptoms of gut problems. They have, maybe they have bloating, maybe they have gas, maybe they have gas that they wouldn't want to stand in an elevator with 10 people with. Uh, these are the types of bacteria that also can create the situations that Dr. Gates is talking about. And so if you're, if you're, you know, if you're overweight and you've been trying everything, this might be a, a valuable piece of information for you to, 
to investigate your gut bacteria, see if you have these obesogenic bacteria, and find somebody who knows how to help you to get it under control. And, and a lot of times, uh, most of the time, our patients will lose weight, mm -hmm. but they're not in here to lose weight. Right. They're not on a weight loss diet. They're not on a calorie restriction diet. Uh, and 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 they're kind of like in and they're kind of like in shock that they're losing this weight because we don't have them going to the gym. Sometimes you'll have them walking, you know, mm -hmm. if they can. If they got severe peripheralty, obviously they can't walk and 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 they still lose weight. So this is a huge, huge, huge thing mm -hmm. to it to me from so, my uh, observations of watching people come in here and lose weight and get healthy. There was one gentleman that stopped yesterday and said, "Well, my peripheralty is it's okay. It's not as good yet." As, uh, as I want it to be. But this is amazing, look at me, I've lost weight, my wife has <laughs> lost weight, and all that kind of stuff. It's like, so, and, and it's a big deal, yeah. and it's a big deal, and eventually yeah. it'll be part of getting his feet better too, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect, I think yeah. we covered it. Okay. So this is the update, things haven't changed since 2014, really. That's the exciting thing. Nice, so, nice. Yeah, um, so you can go to Power Health Talk if you have any questions, and you can find more research there, more information there, and we really appreciate you watching, and we'll see you next week.